Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron of the First Presbyterian Church of Troy, Pennsylvania. Um, preaching this morning, uh, largely using the text from Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16, uh, parable of the workers, but I'm kind of reviewing it in the sermon, so I'm going to dive right in today. You know, if you hang around pastors enough, you hear all kinds of stories. Often the stories are really complaints in search of sympathy, but that's a sermon for another day. One of the complaints you hear is about church insiders who feel they should be accorded some special privilege based on merit. Perhaps their family was one of those who founded the church, or maybe they are one of the biggest givers, or perhaps they've just been logging a lot of volunteer hours over the years. And then they want something. It might have to do with the scheduling of a baptism, wedding, or funeral. It might have to do with picking out the new carpet for the sanctuary. It might have, be that they demand some position of power, like a slot on the pastor nominating committee. It could be anything. Praise God, I have not run into this very often in my churches, but I've seen it just enough to believe the, many of these pastors' complaints. But I've also seen the reverse. I've met some very generous people and some very gifted people who did not want to draw attention to themselves. But it is the truth that we human beings do like to feel like we're better than others. We want people to recognize our work, to thank us, to help us feel special. And of course, all things in moderation. Yes, we want to be appropriately grateful to people who do good things in the world, but not too grateful. The Bible has a lot of warnings about that. Here are a couple of verses from Ecclesiastes 5. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is vanity. But the sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Deuteronomy 24 is one of hundreds of chapters which generate that God, uh, demonstrate that God has greater concern for the poor and the powerless. Verses 14 and 15 instruct employers about paying wages. You shall not withhold the wages of poor and needy laborers, whether other, other Israelites or aliens, meaning immigrants, who reside in your land uh, or in one of your towns. You shall pay them their wages daily before sunset because they are poor and their livelihood depends on them. Otherwise, they might cry out to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. Verses 10 through 13 talk about collateral for small loans, especially if it is in the form of clothing. When you make your neighbor a loan of any kind, you shall not go into the, their house to take the pledge. You shall wait outside while the person to whom you are making the loan brings out the pledge to you. If the person is poor, you shall not sleep in the garment they've given you as pledge. You shall give the pledge back by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in the cloak and bless you. And it will be to your credit before the Lord your God. It probably doesn't make the most business sense to give back your collateral so that the borrower isn't cold when they sleep. But it is a humane thing to do. It's a kind thing to do. It's a loving thing to do. And for the Christian, the foundation of everything is to be love slash charity. I say it that way because the word for Christian love is agape, self-sacrificing love. The King James Version usually translates it as charity to emphasize that something is being given up in this kind of love. If love is at the center of the gospel and self-giving is the most Christian mode of love, then you can see how a sense of entitlement is the opposite of that. If there is a demand that I get what I'm entitled to, then we have stepped outside the bounds of affection and charity. Consider this passage from Matthew 20. Uh, it's, Jesus tells this parable right after a rich man asked Jesus what he had to do to get eternal life and then went away sad because he didn't want to do what Jesus told him. 
namely to give away everything he had. Then Jesus explains how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And then comes our parable. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. So uh, he's hired this first batch really early in the morning. And then he goes out at nine and noon, three, and five, makes the same offer and hires more workers each time. At 6 p.m., he calls in the ones hired at five, gives them a denarius, and sends them on their way. Then the ones hired at three, a denarius. Then the ones hired at noon, a denarius. Then the ones hired at nine, a denarius. Finally, the ones who started out at dawn come and get you guessed it, a denarius. And they're kind of put out about that. They grumble and complain. The landowner, whom I'm sure you understand represents God, says, hey, I gave you what I promised. If I decide to be generous with the others, isn't that my business? So if we translate that to the church, what does it mean? It means that those of us who grew up in the church, who went to youth group, who sing in the choir, who tithe, who sort coats, cook meals, and serve as leaders, we get exactly the same thing as the person who showed up for the first time last month. No privilege, no extra prestige, no bonus. If you view your Christianity as transactional, well, I come to church and I do stuff, and in return I get eternal life, well, if that's your goal, well, you should wait until you get a cancer diagnosis or something. Because if you are trying to min-max this thing, you should wait until the last possible second. Otherwise, you might do some work for the Lord that wasn't strictly necessary in order for you to get your pay. In other words, you want to be one of those workers who's hired at five, only works an hour, and gets a denarius. But of course, if you look at your faith that way, you will miss something important. I don't say this is a threat. Jesus will never cut your pay. He won't exploit you in the way that the worldly companies sometimes exploit laborers. Yes, the work is hard. Yes, laborers in the vineyard are in short supply. But you won't be hired help forever. Here's how Jesus talks about it in John 15, 12 to 17. I'm going to walk us through it one verse at a time. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. This is the currency Jesus deals in. It's love. Verse 13, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. W whoa, that got heavy. Wait, didn't Jesus lay down his life? You are my friends, verse 14. If you do what I command you. Oh, if I'm his friend, he laid down his life for me. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. Now I'm getting it. I'm not just an employee. I'm part of the family. I'm an insider. You did not choose me, but I chose you, he says. Well, that blows my mind. I thought I decided to come in here, but Jesus has been recruiting me all along. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. Bear fruit. So I'm supposed to produce something? But fruit spoils quickly, right? But not this fruit, it lasts, what, forever? And I don't just get paid a salary. The Father will give me whatever I ask. I'm not even sure what that means, but it sounds terrific. Last verse, 17. Jesus says, I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. So the purpose of the whole thing is that I can give and receive love, the agape charitable kind? Wow. 
Listen, my friends, there's no lack for work in God's economy. Instead, there is much for us to do. We must be concerned for people's material war welfare. We want people to have enough food and clothing and shelter. But we are to be equally concerned for people's spiritual welfare. The true currency in God's economy is love. Not just affection, but agape, charitable, self-giving love. To be the true church of Jesus Christ, we must deal equally in both. Too many churches work for people's spiritual or material needs, but ignore the spiritual. And some do the reverse, spiritualizing everything, but never extending material assistance. The thing that ties both together is love. So let's us tie them together in our joint ministry. You know, now that we're deep into this, there's so much I wish I could say, but you can never say every, everything in one sermon. So let me just touch on two more things related to the subject of the wages we receive for our work for the Lord. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, that's a great verse by itself. But if you happen to know anything about 1 Corinthians 15, then you know it is the number one chapter in the Bible describing the resurrection of the dead leading to eternal life. It's an amazing chapter. I recommend that you go read it. All those lovely metaphors about the trumpet. Um, but this is one of the rewards that we do get for our labors, eternal life. Now, I have to confess that I'm sometimes a little shy about talking about that too much. Not because I don't believe in it, I do. Or because I'm not looking forward to it, I am. But because it is so easy when you're talking about eternal life to fall into that transactional mindset that where it is something God owes you, it isn't. But it is something that God gives us, and it is truly wonderful. But wait, there's more. We also receive good things in this life. We receive the Holy Spirit and the gifts it gives us in this life. Here's the list from Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, we are also guided with the Spirit. I have to remind you, we were talking about fruit before, and here's that word fruit again. These are the fruit that we bear, fruit that will last. And we don't have to wait until after death to benefit from being part of God's household, God's kingdom. The Spirit is working in us even now, changing our characters to become more and more Christ-like. As partners rather than employees in this church thing, we have more love, more joy, more peace, and more of all those other things. God is working out God's great plan of salvation in us and in the world through our labors. And that, my friends, is good news. Amen. May God bless you all.